So why don't we get started? Welcome, everyone. It's a, it's a real treat today to have uh, Dan Medwed here to talk about his new book, uh, Bard, which is all about the types of procedural bars which make it next to impossible for the innocent to, to secure their freedom, to, to claim innocence. It's not impossible, as, uh, as Jim Coleman and Evan and Jamie from our uh, wrongful convictions clinic can tell you. Uh, Dan was a founding member of the Innocence Network, which our clinic was a founding member of as well. They've all known each other for, for many years. Uh, Dan is, is joining us from Northeastern Law School, where he is a university distinguished professor, uh, the highest honor on that faculty. Uh, but, uh, you know, earlier in his career, uh, Dan did innocence work. He was, he continues to serve on the board of the New England Innocence Project. Uh, he uh, helped to create a second look program at Brooklyn Law School, which reopened criminal cases. So, you know, Dan has been in the trenches doing post-conviction work, is an academic studying the problems and flaws of our post-conviction system. I left at our Wilson Center offices. We can thank the Wilson Center for sponsoring and making this event possible. Um, the copy of Bard and Why the Innocent Can't Get Out of Prison. So I'll just hold up Dan's private, previous book, which is also really excellent. <laughs> And which is in my office here at the law school. And I strongly also recommend Prosecution Complex, which really looks at the prosecution ethics deficiencies that cause so many wrongful convictions. And, uh, and that's, that's a really important problem and an excellent read. And I strongly recommend this book as well. And I might as well sell this book to you because Dan can already do a good job of, of talking to you about his new book, uh, Bard. And so the thought was, now that I've given Dan a, a few moments to have a little, a little bit of lunch before the event, um, is, you know, Dan's gonna, uh, going to give you an introduction to the book, highlight one of the, the cases that really illustrates the, the pitfalls for the innocent, um, but, you know, for, for more like, like 20 minutes. And so I want you all to be thinking about what questions you have. Um, and, uh, and I have some questions, but we'll, we'll keep things informal and, and, and talk to you about these problems, you know, pretty early on in the night. And so, and so, uh, Think about what kind of questions you want to ask about about these, you know, why it is that we have a system that makes it so hard to claim innocence. Okay, so so come on up, we'll trade places. Thank you so much. Thank you. A special thank you to all of you for spending your lunch with me, um, and of course to Brandon, a longtime friend and colleague. Um, this book actually got its genesis here in this building. Uh, Brandon had a conference three years ago on criminal law books. And I had a really, really crappy idea for a book. And Brandon, in his Brandonish way, said, you, really, you might want to rethink that um, proposal. And I modified it, and it turned into this book. So Brandon, you get a lot of credit. Um, a special uh, amount of gratitude to the Wilson Center as well. You do amazing, amazing work. It's good to see you up front. Um, OK, let me just uh, start off by uh, positing a question for you. At this point, 33 years into the innocence movement, as it's called, we have a pretty good sense. It's often traced to 1989, which is when there was the first documented DNA exoneration in the US, where post-conviction uh, DNA technology of biological evidence from a crime scene exonerated a person beyond a, sh a shadow of a doubt. So we have all this data, much of which uh, Brandon has mined, uh, that tell us why innocent people get convicted. So let's just start with that. What are some of the reasons Many of you probably already know this. What are some of the reasons? Just throw it. There's no wrong answer in law school, right? Wrong person, wrong time. Wrong person, wrong time? Yeah, wrong place, wrong time. Wrong place, wrong time. Uh, certain people, of course, are profiled. People of color, BIPAC communities, right? People who are poor uh, from the wrong side of the tracks are, are overrepresented in the wrongful conviction data set, as are those people in every essential uh, criminal justice or injustice uh, data set. What else? Yes? Coerced confessions. Coerced confessions. A large number of these cases involve coerced and or false confessions, where people will falsely confess to things they didn't do to just get out. Uh, how many times have you felt trapped in office hours with a professor where you'll say that you'd like the class just to get out, uh, when in fact you really don't, right? Uh, Part of being in law school is falsely confessing to things like, sure, I love UCC, you know, because you're talking to a UCC professor. Um, big law's been my dream forever, you say, <laughs> to a, law firm, uh, a recruiting person, right? So we, we can relate to false confessions to sort of escape the situation. So what else? 
false confessions, racial bias, class, yes. Overworked uh, and underpaid public defenders. Absolutely. Overworked and underpaid public defenders in particular, but uh, uh, private lawyers, sometimes called low bono lawyers, private defense lawyers who aren't paid uh, very much. Uh, Brandon, again, has mined a lot of this data. Something about uh, uh, 20% or so of documented DNA cases involve shoddy defense lawyers. Can't just poke fun or poke blame at defense lawyers, though. Who else may be contributing to these injustices? Uh, yeah. Prosecutors withholding exculpatory evidence. Absolutely. Official misconduct by police and prosecutors, especially withholding exculpatory evidence, known as Brady material after a 1963 case, that's a big factor as well. Anything else? Yes. Eyewitness errors. Eyewitness errors, right? Good faith mistakes often by people who just get it wrong. Many of these errors are cross-racial misidentifications where people, due to the segregated nature of our life and the fact that people often look in particular groups as opposed to an interracial or intergroup situation means that there are a lot of good faith errors. Something like 70% of these cases have eyewitness misidentification. Anything else? Those are some of the babies, right? So that wouldn't make for an interesting book, would it? Because Brandon's already written it. Um, you make the incident in 2011, like that would be an interesting book. But what we don't know as much about, and it struck me as something that was worth taking a deep dive into, is why, if it's so easy to convict the innocent on the front end, why is it so darn hard to free them on the back end? What is it about the appellate and post conviction process that makes it virtually impossible, even in compelling cases of actual innocence, to free someone? Okay? So that's what this book is all about. And essentially, it's divided into a couple of different that relate to different areas of the appellate and post conviction process. So there's the direct appeal, and then there are post conviction remedies, and then there are executive branch remedies. Okay? And there's often a diffusion of responsibility in these different remedies, where judges on the direct appeal will say it's not our place to look at claims of innocence. Why? Because the direct appeal, which is not inside in our Constitution, it is just a matter of statute in every jurisdiction, is a vertical remedy that looks exclusively at what happened at trial, and typically only issues that are preserved for review, adequately preserved for review, will be evaluated at the appellate level. So the factual question of guilt or innocence is usually not fair game on the direct appeal. And appellate judges will say, well, that's okay, because that's not the purpose. Our purpose here is to provide a backstop if the trial judge made a mistake, if something went south at trial. But there are these other post-conviction collateral remedies that can handle innocence cases. So let's talk a little bit about those remedies. On the one hand, you have the writ of habeas corpus, the so-called great writ, which crossed the pond and is in our federal constitution in the suspension clause. But what's the writ of habeas corpus all about? It's now been codified. You can go into federal court and you can challenge state court convictions. In many state courts, you can also challenge state uh, convictions. What are courts looking for in habeas corpus? I know there are 10 students in Brandon's habeas <laughs> courts here. We've only had one class. You only had one class, <laughs> okay. But that was a good thing. Read ahead, Brandon. <laughs> that was nervous laughter. Right? <laughs> so, and, and I'm sure Professor Garrett will undoubtedly cover. Um, habeas corpus is principally concerned about constitutional or jurisdictional errors. Has the state court deprived you of a federal constitutional right? Were you tried and convicted in the wrong court? It is not a mechanism for looking at claims of factual innocence. And there's a notorious 1992 case called Pereira versus Collins, which I know is in your textbook, and I'm sure you're going to cover, which says that a freestanding claim of actual innocence by itself may not be recognized in federal habeas corpus. So federal habeas corpus is not a good place for handling innocence claims either. Then there's another bit that virtually every jurisdiction has, and that probably very few people in this room, I don't know if you guys you all know it, I've heard of, which is the writ of error quorum nobis. The phrase quorum nobis means before us, and it allows you to go back to the original trial judge with newly discovered evidence that cast doubt on the integrity of the underlying conviction. Sounds great, right? You find new evidence of innocence, that coerced confession, it comes to light. The poor lawyering comes to light. The Brady material being withheld comes to light. You just 
cobble together that new information, you go back to the trial judge, and you say, look at this new evidence. Had this new evidence been received at trial, the result would probably have differed. Therefore, we deserve a new trial. It sounds great, but in practice it's not, because courts have interpreted that concept of newly discovered evidence in a very narrow fashion. You're often in this weird um, um, sort of a twilight zone where you can't prove the evidence was newly discovered because the court will say that it could have been discovered at the time of trial if the attorney had exercised due diligence. So then you'll argue that it was ineffective assistance by the attorney not to find it, and the court will say, well, not really. It was still effective performance. So you can't prove ineffectiveness, and you can't prove that there's enough evidence for a new trial. So then there are the, these executive remedies. And in fact, in the Herrera case, with the case that I mentioned that said that a freestanding claim of actual innocence is not recognizable in habeas corpus. The justification for that decision, Chief Justice Rehnquist was the one who wrote the majority opinion. He said, from time immemorial, there's always been executive clemency out there, that the king will spare the innocent, the governor, the president, and the, 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 the canon of wrongful convictions is replete with examples where the king, the queen, the governor, the president has spared the innocent. Now, you read this line, it sounds great, but then you actually try to find a case where somebody has been declared innocent, been pardoned on the grounds of actual innocence. And they are few and far between. They usually only happen after a court has already declared the person innocent, or there's been DNA evidence that has cast uh, their innocence into such sharp relief that essentially the governor or the president or the king has to act. The pardon process, the parole process, they're concerned about forgiveness. They're concerned about redemption, right? That's what parole was all about in the 19th century. The whole concept of parole, which occurred in, of course, penitentiaries, the name that evolved in the 19th, uh, 19th century, was about penance and being a penitent and, and somehow expressing remorse and apologizing for what you've done. Well, how do you seek remorse and seek forgiveness if you didn't do it? So I want to tell you a story in my remaining few minutes before we open things up that I think illustrates how these different processes, these procedural booby traps, are the detriment of the innocent. And one of the greatest problems in our country is this idea that the trial is so successful. And we know that the trial is not successful as sorting the innocent and guilty. But on the back end, what appellate and post-conviction judges and executive clemency boards do is they point to the trial and say, that's where factual evidence about guilt or innocence should be discussed, not through our processes. OK, so here's the story. Have any of you been to Long Island, New York? Long Island. Have you been to Brentwood? Good. 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 Say bad things about Brentwood. So, so Brentwood is a bad town in the sense that there's no reason you see in Brentwood. Um, but apparently, someone was in Brentwood on the night of February 3rd, 1999. A large white man walked into a restaurant. They have strip malls in Long Island. Uh, probably, probably not to say any of you. This man walked into a restaurant. It was not a very good restaurant. There was only a cook here and no customer. The man ordered a shrimp dinner. While the cook was preparing the dinner, he put a knife to the waitress's, uh, the cashier's throat, and he asked for her to open up the cash register and give him the money. She complied, and she gave him $32 in change. She screamed, the man fled, the cook comes out of the kitchen, and they both catch a fleeting glimpse of this man as he ducks into a late model white car with a T and a 1 in the license plate, New York place. So that's all they have. Large, heavy-set white man, they put him at uh, mid-30s or so, who has fled in a late model white car with a T and a 1. The police come down with a six-pack. What's a six-pack? Not blood <laughs> Six-pack. Adele? A lineup. A lineup. A photo lineup. Six photographs of people in the community whose photos belong to the police. Their mugshots are there because they have arrest records. Five photos of large white men in their 30s. <laughs> most of whom, if not all of whom, have been convicted of crimes. Independently, the cook and the cashier identify a man named Stephen Schultz as the perpetrator. Fit the bill in a lot of respects. He was six foot two, 250 pounds, and 35 years old. 
He also had a lengthy rap sheet. But he didn't fit the bill in perhaps the most critical respect. None of his crimes displayed any propensity for violence. He had problems with drugs, and he stole money to support his drug habit. But he had never used a weapon in any of his crimes. Nevertheless, that's two IDs from the two victims here, plus a guy who had a lengthy rap sheet. That was enough to charge him with first degree uh, murder, uh, excuse me, first degree robbery. So he's facing upwards of 10 years in prison. He has no money, so he's assigned a local public defender, not from an institutional public defender's office, but from a panel that handles overflow or conflict cases. In New York, it's called the ATB panel. He's a solo practitioner who picks up these cases to basically pay the rent. Okay? So this guy, his name's Barry Levine. <laughs> I shouldn't name him, but I will. <laughs> Barry is in a different county. He's in a town called Mineola, and he's not paying much attention to this case. Stephen doesn't get bail. He's in the local jail in Suffolk County, Long Island, when he reads the local newspaper. It's called Newsday. And he stumbles across the following article. And I'm paraphrasing. Large white man pleads guilty to six robberies. Another man named Anthony Gilfoyle, whose photo was in the newspaper and could have been Stephen Schultz's brother, had just pled guilty to six factually identical storefront robberies in the Brentwood vicinity from January to March 1999. And his MO, his modus operandi, was to go up to clerks and cashiers and intimidate them with his size and occasionally with the threat of a knife. Stephen, the defendant here, looks at this and he calls up his sister. Linda, call Barry. He won't take my calls. This is what resourceful clients do, right? When your lawyer's not, not picking up the phone, you guys are laughing because you know how this works, right? When the lawyers aren't picking up the phone, you get the sister or the mother or the girlfriend to make the call, right? Linda calls Barry. Investigate this. Read the paper today. Barry says he's too busy. Let's see how this plays out at trial. So case goes to trial. Stephen turns down a plea offer of two years because he's innocent. His alibi was that he was home watching television with his roommate. They were watching Dharma and Grit, an ill-fated ABC sitcom. Did any of you know this show? This show. Would anyone lie about having lunch? <laughs> You know, this is not like Money Heist, like a cool thing to say. You guys have seen Money Heist? It's awesome on Netflix, right? It's not something that you would say to brag, I watched Darwin Grip, okay? It's like, I just binge watched, you know, The Fresh Prince of Bel Air. It's just not a cool thing. Well, that's actually pretty cool. But it's not a cool thing to say, right? It's not a cool thing to say. Um, but the um, lawyer doesn't investigate the alibi. He doesn't want to call all the alibi witnesses. So here's what happened at trial. Cook testifies first. And he looks at Stephen Schultz and he says, that's the guy who did it. I recognize him from the restaurant. That's the guy who came to the restaurant, ordered a shrimp dinner, put a knife to my colleague's throat, and then took off in a white car. Later, it turns out that this man had his own pending gun possession charge that disappeared days after his testimony against Stephen Schultz. Then the cashier takes the stand. What happens in the movies at this moment, right? The robbery victim takes the stand. Usually it's one of two things. What happens in the movies? Either like shaky witness, right? That's the guy who ruined my life. Or like bold, powerful victim reclaiming identity. That's the guy. <laughs> but there's a third thing that could happen that I've never seen. I don't know if you've ever seen it. She gets up on the stand and she says, now that I see him in the flesh, I realize that's not the guy. The guy who did it was taller and heavier. Anthony Gilfoyle from that photograph was six foot four, two inches taller than Stephen Schultz, and 350 pounds, 100 pounds heavier than Stephen Schultz. At this point, the defense lawyer has nothing because he didn't bother to investigate the case. He doesn't have an alibi witness. He doesn't know if the cashier would identify the photo of this other man, Anthony Gilfoyle. So he has a choice to make. He could show her the photo, right? He could show her this photo of the man from the newspaper, this other man, Anthony Gilfoyle. But what's the risk of that? What is one of the axiomatic foundational principles of cross-examination? 
You should never ask a question that you don't know the answer to. You have just had the key prosecution witness say, that's not the guy, the guy who's taller and heavier. That could be a reasonable doubt, right? Now, the PS de resistance would be like, could it be this guy from the newspaper who pled guilty to six similar crimes? And she's like, yeah, that's the guy. That's a walk-off home run. But what if she says, no, that's not the guy either. There must be a third tall, heavy set, 35-year-old guy running around this crappy town in Long Island <laughs> committing identical uh, storefront robberies. So he decides to try to get this photograph into evidence. Let the jury decide for itself, he, which is not a bad decision, except under the rules of evidence in New York at the time, you couldn't introduce evidence of what's called third-party guilt unless you could show a clear link between that third party and this crime. In other words, circumstantial evidence that he had a very similar method of operation wasn't enough. So the judge, his name was John Copertino, I just learned this year that his, that his nickname in that courthouse was Crappertino. I didn't know that, right? Copertino said, no, jury can't look at the photo. Then Stephen Schultz is sentenced to 11 years in prison. He's offered three, he declines it because he's innocent, he's sentenced to 11 years. He writes me at the second lift program in Brooklyn Law School, I had just started it up, with a senior colleague of mine, and he asked us to take his case. He asked us to handle the appeal, which was still pending, and to investigate it. So we did. And, and, and largely it was because we were just starting up and we needed cases. If he had written to us three months later, we would have been too busy. You guys can relate to that, right? When you're starting up, you need cases. But like three, six months in, you're too busy, it, it's going to go to the back of the line. And especially when there's already a direct appeal pending, he has a right to a lawyer, it wouldn't have taken priority. It's a robbery case, it's not a murder, would never got, have gotten there. So we began to look at this case, and this is what we found, my students found. My students found the alibi witness, the roommate, and he signed an affidavit that under penalties of perjury that they were watching Dharma and Greg, a very specific show, that we verified was on that night. This is in the pre-streaming uh, era, right? You, could, you looked at TV Guide to figure out what was on, on TV at 8 o'clock on February 3, 1999, and it all added up. He had no criminal record, struck us as a very credible person. Next, we found the witness, the cashier. And guess what? We showed her a photo of this other man, Anthony Gilfwell. And I have this kind of horrible memory of, I was working with my two students, we were trying to come up with our own six pack, and we didn't know how to get photos, so we went through the um, Brooklyn Law School Facebook <laughs> to try to find you know, lots of large, heavy-set white guys that could be misidentified potentially as robbers in Long Island. We could so basically we ended up. It was, you would hate this, Brandon. I shouldn't. I shouldn't. It was a suggestive photo array. We had uh, Anthony Gilfoyle's photo against our client's photo. And we showed it to her, and she said, "This other guy, Anthony Gilfoyle, I'm ninety percent sure that he's the guy who robbed." in a couple years, but I'm not percent sure that that other guy's the one who signed an affidavit. And then we investigated state motor vehicle records. And we found out that registered in the state of New York to one Kim Gilfoyle, the wife of one Anthony Gilfoyle, was a late model white Oldsmobile with a in the one in the license plate. We got all of this new evidence and we sent it to Crappertino, I mean Coffertino, <laughs> the New York equivalent of that quorum nobis procedure I mentioned. We held the direct appeal in advance, waiting to see how this post-conviction remedy would play out. I drove out to Riverhead, New York with my student, and you guys can relate to this. I had two objectives. The most important objective was to look smart in front of my student. <laughs> my secondary objective was to help my client. Yeah. It was inverted. But I, I also wanted to put on a good show for Roger, right? To make it to like as a to, as a pedagogical tool. Um, and uh, we had to convince this judge to give us a hearing. I wasn't asking for a new trial at this stage. All I was asking for was, Your Honor, let's have an evidentiary hearing where the waitress, the alibi witness, someone from the DMV can all testify and present this evidence to you, Your Honor. And then, in your Solomonic wisdom, if it makes you think that perhaps this conviction is specious, 
then you may, you may, I don't know what I'm doing. you may, it's, my watch is saying that I'm walking right now. <laughs> <laughs> if you and your soul modern wisdom think that there should be a new trial, you can order a new trial. I made this case. Seems like a slam dunk. And he looks me in the eye and he says, no. <laughs> Not on my watch. I remember this case. <laughs> I remember this case, and the reason she didn't identify her client is she was scared. She was scared. I'm not going to hold an evidentiary hearing, let alone give you a new trial. We appealed that decision, and we filed it together with the direct appeal of this conviction. Lost in the appellate court, and here's why. The direct appeal was limited just to the things that happened at trial. And that decision to exclude the photograph was a decision in which a judge has a lot of discretion. And to get an appellate court to reverse a decision like that, you would have to show that the judge abused his discretion. And we couldn't show that, because there wasn't a clear link between this Anthony Guilfoyle and this particular robbery. He could have exercised his discretion in the right way to do justice, but because he didn't, we couldn't prove that it was an abuse. Couldn't win on the direct appeal. And similarly, his decision to deny an evidentiary hearing was subject to deference as well. The appellate court wrote, Judge Cappuccino presided over the trial. Judge Cappuccino is familiar with the facts of this case. If he doesn't think that an evidentiary hearing is warranted, that is his judicial prerogative. He petitioned to the highest court in New York, and we got one dissent. We lost. One judge said, you know, there's like an innocent guy here. The waitress should appear in open court to be asked about this other man in the field. But we lost. We lost. Eight years later, we won in federal habeas corpus. We had given up, and this part's not in the book because it's too embarrassing. We had given up on the case. We didn't think there was anything to do. We didn't think we could win on habeas. He files a pro se habeas petition. The judge looks at it and says, let's have a hearing. Then, like classic legal vultures, we swoop back in to take the case. <laughs> we were representing Stephen, sorry, we were like kind of busy. And there was an evidentiary hearing about this case, and he was freed. But because, as I mentioned, under federal habeas corpus, a claim of actual innocence alone is not enough to get relief, he won on the grounds of ineffective assistance of counsel that his trial attorney had failed to investigate the case properly and had made a bad strategic decision by not um, um, calling the outside witnesses to the stand. So he was free eight years after his wrongful conviction, months before he would have been released on good time anyway. He gets out and he says, Dan, thank you, but I should have taken that plea. Thank you. He became a driver, and he called me from Maine a few months later because he had tasted lobster. But the taste of freedom might have been delicious. It, it wasn't lucrative. Because he hadn't been declared innocent, he could not and never has received compensation for what happened to him. I talked to him recently, uh, shortly before the book came out, because I wanted to verify some of the facts that were just based on my memory that you know, he'd given me clearance to talk about. And we were having this really nice chat. He's living in New Jersey, which I guess is a bad sign. But he's living in New Jersey <laughs> with his longtime girlfriend, Lisa, and their dog, Christmas, a stray they found on the 25th of December. And I asked him, like, what's the best thing about your freedom? I mean, Stephen, we've been friends now for 20 years. You've been out for 15. Like, what's the best thing? And he said, um, Dan, my debit card. Did they not have debit cards in 1999? Like, no, they did. I remember him. I'm like, why? He said, oh, well, I use it every 25 miles on my long haul route because it gives me an alibi. I'm never going to be tagged for something I didn't commit. I don't use cash. I buy a pack of gum, then I buy a beer, and I buy some cigarettes. I just stop every 25 miles because there's no way I'll be tagged for something I didn't commit. And that's not the end of it. He called me two months ago, and I think you guys can relate to this. It's great to keep in touch and hear from your former clients, but there's always this like pit in your stomach, like, what has the shoe dropped, right? And this has been over 20 years, right? And he's like, Dan, I need a lawyer. Do you know a housing lawyer in Jersey? It took 
eight years to free a demonstrably innocent person where there was a photograph of the true suspect in the friggin' newspaper before trial. The lawyer had just gone to that waitress and photograph. I wouldn't be talking about this case now. The lawyer messed up. The prosecutor messed up. The police messed up. We messed up by not staying the course on that habeas petition. And he's the one who's paid the price. Look how easy it was to convict him on the front end. And so unbelievably hard it was to free him on the back end. And we didn't even get a declaration of this. Thank you. I think I went a little bit over. But let's open things up for questions. Christmas is really cute. I have a picture. <laughs> Super cute. Stretch. Like, you know, you know, maybe I'll put the... Display the book cover here. Oh, so that's good. So we don't just have a boring blank screen. You know, I, I'm actually a bum because the publisher wouldn't let me have a picture of Christmas with Stephen. Mm -hmm. No, something about his pants. That's pretty good, though. There we go. Yeah. Yeah. We mostly have it up on the screen. Yeah. yeah. There's like a bard. Yes. Yeah. So, as I hear you tell that story, a couple of things stand out to me. Yeah. Um, one is kind of his line of, I should have taken the plea deal, right? And that, to me, and the other is the fact that it was kind of added capacity of, like, your students being able to pursue these investigative leads that I think led to this, as you say, very easily discoverable and provable thing of innocence to, to go for. And I guess I'm wondering, given that it seems to me that, prison, that the justice system is as much a prosecution factory as it is a liberal justice, yes. and that the kind of utter lack of capacity for people to get competent defense seems to be an issue here. Do you have thoughts on kind of what kind of judicial reforms we can make so that there is more competent defense yes. for these kinds of situations? Excellent. So there are lots of different thoughts, and, and that's a great question. Um, the first thing is to minimize what's called the trial tax, right? The discrepancy between the plea offer and your exposure if you're convicted at trial. So the plea offer for Stephen was three. He ultimately got 11. So many of us, and I suspect those of you in the second row would share this view, would call that eight-year differential a tax. It's a tax on your constitutional right to go to trial, because you're going to be incentivized to take the three if you're all risk averse. And lots of innocent people, the National Registry of Exoneration is the last time I checked, listed 547 plea cases where innocent people took these deals. If you're remotely risk averse, you're going to take the deal. If you guys could all get Bs in all of your courses right now, without doing any work and without taking the final exam, would you do it? Yes. Okay. <laughs> now let me give you more information. Let me give you more information. Your professors graded the high end of the curve, and the high end and the curve in this fictional Duke world is an A minus. So very few people, if they stay the course, are going to do worse than a B plus. Would you still take the deal? Wouldn't. What if I were to tell you that the curve is like a C minus, and some of your professors love to give Fs? <laughs> You'll take the deal. But what if I don't give you any of that information? What, what, if you're, what if you're pleading blind, as they say? Stevens offered three years. He doesn't know what the likelihood of being convicted is, because he doesn't have all the evidence against him, because prosecutors aren't required to do it. And even the evidence that is required to be disclosed, and one of you mentioned Brady material, I think you did, maybe hasn't been turned over. And we can't hold the prosecutors accountable because we don't know what they're doing behind closed doors. How do we know if there is Brady material, there's a chicken or an egg problem, or is it chicken and egg, whatever it is, there's a problem. How do we know if it's Brady material unless it's turned over? But Brady material is only an issue if it isn't turned over. So that is just fortuitous if you later find the Brady material. So minimize this trial time. This is a controversial point that I've made because people on the left, sort of due process progressives, would say, well, we want to get the best deals possible for our clients, so we don't mind the trial tax. If you were to minimize the trial tax, then a lot of my clients are not going to get a three-year offer. They're going to get an eight-year offer. And I'm going to say, well, you know what? That's all right. Because it's that gap. It's that differential that's, what in that's inducing innocent people to plead guilty. Second, in terms of um, ineffective assistance and, and lawyers, obviously money is a big part of it. 
funding public defense is a huge issue. And I know the center with Dell and Brandon, you're doing this amazing study out in Berkshire County, my way, about plea offers and trying to figure out how pleas are negotiated in this county in Massachusetts. One of the obstacles potentially is that the public defender's office is worried about its funding, if it's possibly involved in this activity, right? There's always a concern about funding. To add insult to injury, we have a US Supreme Court that a few months ago issued a decision called Shin versus Martinez that basically will make it very, very difficult for Stephen Schultz, people in Stephen Schultz's position to ever prevail. So your point about um, the benefit of having students working on this case, the reason why Stephen ultimately won, and it wasn't because we did a good job, because I said we didn't, at least we found evidence of his lawyer's ineffectiveness. So there was a record, post-conviction record of his ineffectiveness that a judge could cite to in habeas review. This decision in the spring by the US Supreme Court says that it is the uh, prisoner's fault if a post-conviction lawyer fails to develop the evidence that would show ineffective assistance of a trial attorney. That the prisoner is, uh, the lawyer is essentially an agent of the client, and the lawyer's failings are essentially attributable to the prisoner. And habeas judges may not even hold evidentiary hearings in these situations. Stephen Schultz got lucky because he had people that had that evidence. Most people that could work for his case, most people don't have that situation. So I mean, that doesn't really answer your question, but I think narrowing that gap for the trial tax could be a big piece of it. Yes, yeah. yes um, so in North Carolina, we have Innocence Commission, yeah. and if someone can make it through all the steps to have a finding of actual innocence, get the pardon, they are entitled to compensation. Yes. And other states like Texas are much more generous with compensation. Mm -hmm. Do you think that if compensation were more readily available or if states were more obligated to provide compensation for innocent people, that that could prevent wrongful convictions or help to minimize wrongful convictions because the state's motivated to not have to pay those those payments out? I think that's a really good point. I think that's a really, really important point. A couple of thoughts on that. It's, it's, on the one hand, yes. If the state is worried about its bottom line and they'll have to pay out these sizable multi-million dollar judgments, then they might be a little bit more careful, just for sheer fiscal prudence um, and the politics of being um, um, not especially uh, fiscally savvy. Right? But the problem, on the other hand, is there's what's called a diffusion of fiscal responsibility in our criminal justice where the state often pays for incarceration, state government, and often will pay for these um, damage awards. But it's the county that's prosecuting these cases, right? County level DAs. So this is something that some people have written about, which is sort of like, even though it's all like state money, the way it's often allocated is through county and state resources. Um, there's a diffusion where the county DA's office doesn't pay the full fiscal brunt, both the brunt of incarcerating someone who's innocent, which is expensive, and the brunt of a state damage award down the line, because it's a separate budget stream. So like that's another piece of this too. It's like you're in a prosecutor's office. It's like, ah, if you get it wrong, someone else will have to pick it up. This lot. But I think it would help on the margins, absolutely. And having these really bad caps on damage awards, in addition to being just unfair, um, don't have that deterrent effect. In New Hampshire, I think this is still the case, you can only get $20,000 per year of incarceration. Great question. A lot of the problem is that like the facts haven't really been fully developed yes. at the trial stage. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious who is able who has the discretion to hold an evidentiary hearing? Like is it it was I keep on I feel like I've heard a lot of cases like the original trial judge has the discretion to reopen it. But is it always that? Because it seems like that judge would be less likely to actually hold an evidentiary That's a hearing. Great question. So here's how it works. In the quorum nobis procedure that I mentioned. That phrase, as I think I, I said, means, or maybe I didn't mention this, it's before us. That's what Court Nova stands for. And the idea is you go back to the original judge where the case was heard, and that judge has a faint memory, at least, of the facts, and is in the best theoretical position to determine whether this new evidence would have made a difference. That's the theory behind it, at least when it started in 16th century England, when there wasn't the same docket glut Right? Where a judge might remember this you know, robbery from a couple of years ago. Because maybe they had a few cases a year. But nowadays, can you be sure that Judge Copertino could remember this? No, that, that rationale doesn't really hold up. But it's a very sticky one. 
And under quorum nobis, that's how it works in virtually every jurisdiction that I'm aware of. Habeas corpus is different. Habeas corpus means um, you have the body. And the idea is you're forcing the government to justify why it's detaining someone. So you go to the place of detention, the county where the person is incarcerated, and you go before an independent judge. That's how it typically works in the federal level and in most state courts. So let's tease this out because it's a really good question. The advantage of not knowing the case before is what? What's the advantage of that? Objectivity. Objectivity. You have a visiting professor who's teaching a class. You've never heard anything about this person. There's not a rumor mill like there is for in-house, out-house and in-house professors. Right? <laughs> but, but there's not a, right? You know every professor here what their rep is. The first day you go to class, it's not an objective assessment. You've heard good things, you've heard bad things, whatever. You've heard mixed things. It's an outsider. Maybe you know nothing. You can be truly objective. But is that always a good thing? You don't have all that information. You go into the class and you know nothing. You could be hoodwinked. You could be duped. At least having more information, the good, the bad, and the ugly, could lead to a more informed decision. Right? But the downside with having lots of information is what? So the upside of not having information is objectivity. You can give it a totally, totally objective look. You go into a movie, you've not seen a single review of it. You don't even know the name of the movie don't know what it's about. Completely objective, and it could be a horrible movie that's miserable for you. But what if you've read all of these great reviews of the movie, and you show up, and it's not quite as good as you expect? The problem with having too much information is you have a stake in the venture. And if you're a judge who's presided over the conviction of an innocent person, even if your role in the case was more indirect than direct, what do you think your subconscious or unconscious bias will be? Judge Coppertino, I like to make fun of him because he's an asshole, but... At least not in the open space. Um, in the north, that's just like politeness. Yeah, I mean, Judge Coppertino gave him some credit. And maybe it's because he convinced himself of that to reconcile the fact that he had presided over the conviction of a potentially innocent man when he's confronted with all this evidence of a potential mistake. Right? The, there's all this data saying that people stay in really flawed and toxic romantic relationships for years longer than they should. And instead of viewing it as a sunk cost, like I've made a mistake and now I'm out, we tend not to view it that way. We tend to view it as some type of like reflection on our own judgment, and we tend to then see things in a way that would justify our original decision. We discount all the evidence that we're in a bad relationship, or that this is, something's wrong here, and we emphasize all the evidence that supports our pre-existing decision, because it makes us feel like we're better people. called the egocentric bias, and we've all heard about this. 99% of people think they're of above average intelligence. <laughs> like, like, how is it possible? <laughs> like, have you ever met someone who honestly would be like, I'm of below average intelligence? <laughs> I mean, they might say it, but they're doing it, it's like the angle, like the sad sack angle. It's not like, a legitimate thing. <laughs> and I mean, judges in particular talk about the egocentric bias. So I think it's true, it's a mix. You want a fresh judge, a fresh take, but you don't know what you're getting. The old judge knows something about the case, but they have skin in the game, they have a stake in it, which is a problem. Uh, what are your thoughts on extending sort of the right to counsel to sort of like initial review of uh, collateral proceedings? Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I think it would be essential. I think it's absolutely essential. The fact that it's discretionary now, I, I find appalling. And it goes back to, I think, your comment about disparities in access to resources. Right? There's a lot of reason to think, of course, that certain people get the benefit of certain resources. Is it coincidental that Stephen Schultz was a white man? Is it coincidental that his sister Linda had happiness to locate the lawyer, call the lawyer, follow up in the case, follow up with me for years? Had the resources to house Stephen when he was freed from prison and had nowhere to go and no compensation? 
white, middle-class-ish family that had access to resources and knew how to navigate the system, including keeping my cell phone with him for 20 years so that when he needs a lawyer, he knows he can prey on my Jewish guilt and get one. Okay? So access to an automatic right to post-conviction counsel would be a way of minimizing some of those inherent inequities and disparities based on class, based on um, uh, language skills, all of the, uh, national origin, all of these different factors that play into who gets out and who doesn't, who has access to an innocence project and who doesn't. So from my perspective, having a right to post-conviction counsel at the initial review stage is necessary. The argument you hear against it, of course, sure, we'll fund that, but that means we won't fund the schools. <laughs> No early education programs in North Carolina if we fund first, you know, uh, post-conviction uh, review. It's a red herring argument, but that's the response you get, right? We could, we, could, we could support criminal justice, but it has to come out of another... another. Kids must suffer. Have you heard, you've heard that, right? The kids will suffer. <laughs> or the elderly. It's either hospitals or schools. <laughs> or in the legislature. We could fund criminal justice, but then we want to fund schools or uh, any emergency room for people who uh, lack resources to pay. So if you want to have a lot of dead kids and dead old folks around, sure, we can give some hack lawyers a little extra money. It's not an issue here because we pay for our schools with traffic tickets. <laughs> <laughs> we have other criminal revenues. Yeah, it's a very good. Other questions? Yes. Um, so you kind of mentioned earlier in response to another question um, that we could like reduce the plea tax. Yeah. And I guess I was wondering, just generally, like, who is supposed to bear the cost of us reducing the plea tax? And, like, what kind of, what kind of timeline are we supposed to have for, like, judicial reform? Like, how many, what's the collateral damage like? You know what I'm saying? Like, if we do have a number of people um, take, like, who advocate for these, these lower plea taxes, yeah. understandably, and then, like, we have more people taking those pleas or not taking them and, like, still having high jail time either way, it's like, yeah. okay, is that supposed to go on for 50 years before we can expect, like, change and I and I even pop that question more broadly like how long is this fakes if it's so deeply entrenched you know that, that you've hit the big question right so the big debate in criminal justice right now is revolution versus evolution so people like me middle-aged white guys it makes sense for us to say evolution because we're part of the system and we can suggest incremental changes like changing the trial tax because chances are I'm not gonna get stopped or my kids aren't gonna get stopped and I won't be wrong but a lot of other people, especially people who are at greater risk for them and their family, of being embroiled in an in unjust prosecution. So, right? For the system to sort of percolate in such a slow fashion. And that's why, of course, there's been a strong movement toward prison abolition, to abolishing cash bail, to defunding the police, all of these big things. And I'm sure this is a debate that's been raging in Duke, right, on your campus for people who are concerned about criminal justice. A lot of the debate seems to be simmering now. At the height of it, in the aftermath of the murder of George Floyd, it seemed possible that some of these reforms wouldn't just be gradual, right? Wouldn't just be evolutionary that could be revolutionary. But we didn't necessarily capture that moment for a lot of different things. And that fight between the evolutionaries and the revolutionaries is one of the reasons why the left is not very effective right now, in my view. In the aftermath of George Floyd's murder, a bunch of us in Boston got together like, what can we do? Like, we are in this uh, blue state, supposedly. And like, if we're going to do something dramatic, like, we have a pretty good chance given our location. And I said, well, let's just get rid of chokeholds. Let's get the, the Boston police that killed someone a couple years ago, Teddy Rivera. Got, let's just get rid of chokeholds. And one of my friends, far left of me, a man of color, said, don't you do that. You're going to take the air out of the room. Let's defund the police. Let's take out the police now. Let's take this moment to get rid of the police. And I turned to him and I said, that, that's not going to happen. And he said to me, it's not going to happen because people like you say it's not going to happen. And I said, but it's still not going to happen. And if we don't go for chokeholds, we're not going to get chokeholds. He said, I don't care about chokeholds if we still have the police because they'll find some other way to kill people. I said, no, they won't be doing it through chokeholds, right? <laughs> But it was, it was the debate between evolution, revolution, incrementalism, and, and more dramatic change. And it was also a debate between people who had sort of different perspectives on the impact of the system. And my friend 
had a much more visceral experience. As a black man in Boston, a former defense lawyer, uh, a, a district attorney, an ACLU lawyer who just lost uh, a race for district attorney of a county, unfortunately, he was going to be a progressive prosecutor, but he, he lost, right? He wanted to just change it all. So I think the answer is really probably more up to your generation than mine, right? What should that balance be between evolution and revolution? But I think they go together. You need the revolutionaries to keep the evolutionaries honest. You need the evolutionaries to maybe get some of the things done that can get done in the interstices of the system. But you need them both. So my guess is about 8.6 years. <laughs> <laughs> consequences for prosecutorial misconduct, right? Do you think that that is at least something that is a step in the right direction? That's a great point. That is a step in the right direction. And that is, <laughs> great, that is a great point. So prosecutorial misconduct. The idea, of course, is they could face criminal sanctions or civil sanctions for egregious forms of misconduct. What is the likelihood that a prosecutor will face civil sanctions, be sued for damages, for prosecutorial misconduct? How does that work? Does anyone, you've you only had one day of class um, from here. There's a concept known as absolute immunity. So that prosecutors are absolutely immune, for the most part, for any type of misconduct during the litigation phase of a case. If they're involved in the investigative phase, they get qualified immunity, which is good safety. Either way, you're not going to hit them where it hurts in the pocketbook. What is the likelihood, then, of a criminal sanction going against a miscreant prosecutor? I know of one case, the Michael Morton case, prosecutor in Austin, Texas, who was convicted of a misdemeanor and served three days? Something like that? Three days. Three days. Two days. He was involved in the investigative phase. He lied about evidence. Yeah, that was it. OK, so then let's disbar those dudes. Let's just disbar them, and that's what I'm trying to do. I'm part of a in New York, we're called Accountability New York. There are six of us where we are looking at documented cases of prosecutorial misconduct, and we're filing disciplinary complaints against them. And the reason we're doing it is because tenure has to be good for something. <laughs> I mean, like, we're not, defense lawyers can't do it because There'll be consequences. They'll never get a good plea deal again. File a complaint against the prosecutor. You're never going to get a plea deal for any of your other clients. And you're also going to be discredited as someone who has an ax to grind. So we can be objective academics who are just filing these complaints. So we did this in New York. We went after 21 prosecutors in Queens, a bunch in Brooklyn, and they threatened to sue us and disbar us. And we went to the papers. The New York Times covered it, and so now they backtracked and we're in litigation with them right now, so I can't comment any further. Right? We're involved in a civil, we sued them. We sued them for violating our First Amendment rights because they were trying to stop us from talking. So we're doing that in New York. Laura Bazelon, somebody we work with, is doing it in California. Right? That's something that you guys can do. You could do a prosecutorial misconduct project. You could find prosecutors in North Carolina who have engaged in documented misconduct, I mean, this is not water cooler stuff. It's not rumor and innuendo. It's a case from the Supreme Court saying that there was misconduct. The person is not going to be named because prosecutors are never shamed by names in these opinions. You just get the transcript, you figure out how who it is, and you put it on blast. It's on the website, and then you file a grievance with the New York State, uh, the North Carolina Bar. Now, if you don't want to practice criminal law in North Carolina, I think that's a pretty good idea. <laughs> Students who have helped, we, we've been building a database of every reported decision going back five years describing a uh, Brady violation. In, in North Carolina? In the country. Country? Uh, okay. So it's, uh, and how often do they name the police or prosecutors? So. It's, it's like 10%. It's not very Yeah, not very often. And obviously relief is rare. Yeah, relief is rare. Relief is rare. He just got, we, uh, Nina Morrison, who works for the, was at the Innocence Project, she just became a federal judge over the summer. You might have heard about her. She was attacked by Tom Cotton during her hearings this summer, um, the first uh, LGBT, openly LGBTQ federal judge in New York. Um, Nina and I filed a complaint against um, three prosecutors in Massachusetts uh, for this crime lab scandal, for a Brady violation. 
five years. It took us five years, and it's still going through the process, but one of them is going to be disbarred. You can take on the prosecutors, right? And it's not just about punishing those prosecutors. It's about sending a message to all the other ones. We're watching. We're watching you. Now, will that cause them to just hide more evidence so they can be found? I don't know. But maybe when they're sitting in their office on a Saturday night before a Monday trial and they're thinking about whether to put it in the, in, in, in the cabinet or actually turn it over to defense counsel, they'll think, those students at Duke might find me one day. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to turn it over. So I agree with you completely. That's something that can be done. That's a little hanging for it. Your answer, I really appreciate it. Um, I guess, like, obviously, when we're talking about the trial tax, we have the cost of like people being like, I'm gonna stand up for my rights, yes. and then they still get convicted, and then they have 11 years, you know. And we assume that that's just going to happen for several years until there's a change. Like, what other costs do you think could come into play? Like, if we do get a trial tax, do you think legislatures will then be like, okay, well, if, if we now have this lower incentive to take pleas, we'll make an incentive via the law and, like, I don't know, make some law for doing something everyone does to capture more people in the system? Like, what do you think are the side effects of, like, That's, good I like the way you're thinking reform. about it. I, I love that, the way you're thinking, which is the domino effect, right? Like, so if you push this down, it looks good, but it's going to hit something else, right? If you change the plea tax, you make it smaller. The good thing, the good part of the domino is fewer innocent people will be induced to take a deal, right? If you're facing three and you're looking at 11, you'll take the three even if you're innocent because you're just risk averse. But if you're looking at eight versus 11, you're like, I might as well go to trial, I'm innocent. And some of them will be acquitted, some prosecutors will presumably drop a weak case before going to trial and lose it. So that's the good part. The bad part, as you point out, is some innocent people are gonna get a worse deal than they would've gotten before. Some risk averse people will take eight years instead of three now. And some risk averse people, or people who are a little less risk averse, will go to trial and still lose. But, 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 it will probably send a message to prosecutors, the positive thing, that if you have a weak case and you're not going to secure a conviction at trial, drop it now. Prosecutors are very reluctant to decline to prosecute. There's some data suggesting it's around 20 to 25 percent in a lot of jurisdictions. They don't want to antagonize the police. The police have arrested the person. They hand over the file to the prosecutor. The prosecutor then says, no, I disagree with your assessment. There's no probable cause. What's going to happen to that prosecutor? Are the police going to show up to test a lie? No. Are the police going to go, <laughs> <That's> go, find, <laughs> are the police going to go find witnesses on the eve of trial and track them down and bring them to court for that? No. <laughs> Is the police union going to campaign against them? Yes. yes. So, but the other, and there are other you know, bad consequences, of course, right, which could mean that maybe fewer innocent people will be convicted, but the ones who are being convicted are in there for longer. So are you robbing Peter to pay Paul, right? Like, and that is definitely a collateral, a collateral damage war. Also, the signal could be, hey, we've changed the trial tax. So that means that if people um, are convicted at trial and they've turned down a plea, they really are guilty. Right? This idea that like any innocent person, it will, it will create this narrative that, all, that guilty people will always take a deal if they're offered one, if you decrease that tax. And we know that's not true. There are many, many people, we know these people, we've read about these cases, who are facing capital charges, who are looking at life, and they're offered like a two-year sentence, and they'll say, no, I'd rather go to the chair than to be considered guilty for this horrific. So I think there, I have to think about it some more. You, you got me thinking. Because I think there are a lot of collateral consequences. Thank you so much, Dan. Thank you very much.